Voilà. Ok. Um, I want to start the class today by telling you about two, two other constructions of how to make new polytopes from old polytopes. Imagine this. This we can do in higher dimensions. I want. I want to say something that, even though our intuition is in two and three dimensions mostly, it it helps in higher dimensions. And sometimes it doesn't help because sometimes it just confuses you. But it's it's good to always keep track of of the dictionary between algebra and, and the geometric intuition that you have. So here, if we are to to generalize this construction, then we're going to take a polytope in RD okay. and then what we're thinking is that we're embedding RD into RD plus 1 embed RD as the let's say that is the hyperplane where the last coordinate is equal to 0 equals zero, right? And then basically what you get is, is the, 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 new the new coordinates of P are the same as the old coordinates of P, except that they have a new coordinate xd plus one which is equal to zero. And so if you want to construct the pyramid of P, then you take the convex hull of Like I said, you take all the points in P, and then you add a uh, last coordinate equal to zero. And then you just add this new vertex, and you just make it be maybe the, the, the unit vector. assignment to prove that the combinatorial type of the pyramid depends only on the combinatorial type of P. So, and I'll say exactly what this means, but maybe let's say this, that the, the face 
the face structure. pyramid depends so is determined by the face structure Basically, is that if you take two pentagons, maybe they have different coordinates, uh, but then when you take their pyramids, they're going to have the same faces, uh, and the, the combinatorial incidence of the faces doesn't depend on the coordinates that you chose, just on the combinatorial. Okay? So, this is a homework exercise. And the other part of the homework exercise is that if you, if you know the f vector of p, then you can find the f vector of the pyramid. And that's really what the, I mean, that's what the homework says, but then, in the, well, you prove that, you're going to have to prove this also. This will be part of your proof, okay? So those are pyramids. Any questions about pyramids? Same thing as in three dimensions, but at higher dimensions. The second construction that I want to discuss is vertex figures. For this, maybe what I will do is draw a picture, which is not so easy, but I'm going to try. this to look three-dimensional to you. Is it looking three-dimensional? So it's, it's almost like a pyramid over a quadrilateral, except that the quadrilateral that you might see is not flat, but it's really, it's really two flaps. Okay. So the vertex figure is basically what you get when you, when you chop off the polytube close to V. So you just kind of make a, make a cut with a knife and see what, you, see what the cut looks like. So, if you make a cut like this, then maybe you will see something like this. And that's what we would call the vertex figure. Okay. Let me make this three dimensional so this should be. Yeah? So that's the idea. And then this, this little polytope, which lives in one dimension smaller, is going to be the vertex figure, and we call it B mod B. Okay. So what are we doing here? Um, B is a vertex, and so how, how do I make precise that I'm making a cut? I mean, there's a lot of freedom there, right? But the point is that if you make different cuts, then as, as long as you're close to the vertex, it doesn't really matter what cut you make. But so how do we make this precise? One way of doing it is you say, well, let's choose, let's choose a linear function that maximizes b. Because b is a vertex, we can find it. And so maybe there's some hyperplane here. And maybe the equation is. Uh, C dot x equals C zero. Okay? And so I'm, I'm saying let's 
is, let's say that the vertex is the phase that maximizes the function c. Okay? And then what you do basically is, is just move c0 a little bit. Okay? So what this means is that c dot uh, b equals c0. So that means that b is on that red plane. And c dot p is less than or equal to c0 for any inequality. Okay. And then what I'm going to say is just, just take this slice to be given by a plane parallel to this one. So something like c dot x equals c1. And just make sure that c1 is small enough that it doesn't uh, interact with the rest of the polytope, but only with that part of it. Okay. Um, we choose c1 less than c0. Um, but I should say, but very close to 0. Very close to c0. And then I define the vertex figure to be the intersection of P with this hyperplane. Okay. And this is why this is the vertex figure that I'm defined. Okay. And so again, a fact is that the combinatorial type of P mod B depends only on, on the combinatorial type of P and So if you, if you take a polytope P that is combinatorially isomorphic to this one, it has the same faces, and then you, you pick the same vertex B and you make the same cut, you're going to get the same combinatorics. Is this kind of clear to you, or is, or is it kind of mysterious? <laughs> clear? Mysterious? Clear? Um, Let's, let's think about this. How do we, I, I want to say one more thing about this. How do you describe the faces of the red polytope? So let's say that you want to uh, describe the, the faces of B mod B. What do they correspond to? The faces of P that contain B. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's a correspondence. So for example, this red edge here corresponds to this triangle that contains B. Or this vertex here corresponds to this line segment that contains B. And there is a correspondence, a one to one correspondence between the faces of P mod B and the faces of P contain B. Except for B. Not except for B because uh, it corresponds to the empty face. So this is really a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and I can even say a little bit more. If you have a k-dimensional phase here, then that corresponds to a k-minus one-dimensional phase. And uh, one way of describing this one-to-one -one correspondence is basically take a phase f, then the corresponding phase here is f intersect the red hyperplane. And it, it requires a proof to say this, but it's 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 not hard. And it's, it's not a homework exercise, but it's maybe uh, a little detail for you to fill in. But it's not hard. Okay. 
So, so those are vertex figures. Any questions about that? One thing that I want you to realize, if we now go back to the previous page, to the previous thing that I discussed, that if you take a pyramid, and if you take the vertex figure with respect to the special vertex, then you get B back. So in a sense, this is kind of like an on-pyramid uh, construction. Or it's Okay, so let's let's go to our next topic, which is a, a very important topic, and I think a very nice topic, which is the phase lens. So, how many of you know what a poset is? Maybe if I say in Spanish, it's better. Conjunto parcialmente ordenado. Let's review it, because maybe you've seen it, but maybe not in the way that I want to discuss it. So let's talk about posets. So, definition. By the way, if you have taken any class from me, I must have defined poset, because everything I do... Basically, in combinatorics, we love posets. Let me just put it this way. Not only in combinatorics, but, but in combinatorics we love them. And, and so, a poset is short for partially ordered set. You know that Americans are lazy and they don't like to say <laughs> long things, so instead of saying all of this, they just say poset. That's why. Um, I don't know if Colombians are less lazy. Some people say conjunto parcialmente ordenado, but then some people just say poset, and some people just say copo, which I think is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think I think in Mexico they say copo. Conjunto parcialmente ordenado. It's equally bad as this. But okay. Anyway, so but poset is a very common name. So so, and I think actually in Spanish it's fairly common to just call them posets. Posets. Okay. So a poset is given by a pair like this. Of is a pair a set P equipped with a partial order. I guess I should say a binary relation such that and it has three properties that it should satisfy. So first is that x should always be less than or equal to x. Second is that if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to z, then x is less than or equal to z. Okay. And the third one is that if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, then actually they should be the same element. Okay? one of these definitions that doesn't really tell you anything. So I think the way you should think about this is that it's, it's a set where it has an order, but the order is partial, like the name implies, meaning that for every pair of elements, you have three choices. You have three choices. For, three, for two elements, x and y, either x is less than y, y is less than x, or x and y are incomparable. For two different elements, x and y. You either one is less than the other one, one is bigger than the other one, or there is no way of comparing. That's what that's how you want to think about this. And uh, some examples. 
And the, the first kind of silly example is if you take something like the, the natural numbers and the order less than or equal. And we like to draw pictures for these things. So here there's a big cultural difference actually. So in Colombia, zero is a natural number. But maybe you don't even agree. It's, according to some people, zero is natural. According to some people, zero is not natural. Um, let's say the zero is natural, okay? And then it's the smallest one, and then the next one is one, and the next one is two, three, and so on, okay? So this is how we like to draw these things. But let's do maybe a, a more interesting example. Actually, this is a very fundamental example. So this is the collection of subsets. So I don't know if I've told you in this class already that when a combinatorialist writes n in square brackets, that means the number, the set of numbers from one up to n. And then two to the, that set is the power set. So it's it's the collection of sets. So these are all all the subsets of one up to n. And so then, how do you decide? to compare two sets. Well, basically by, by containment. So either A is contained in B, B is contained in A, or neither. So that's why this order is partial. So let's draw a picture. So the smallest is the empty set. Then above that, we have the one element sets, and I'm going to be lazy and not write all the brackets, so one, two, and three. Okay. Then we have the two element sets, so for example, one, two is a two element set, which contains one and contains two. And then one, three contains one and contains three. And two, three contains two, contains three. And then finally, I have the whole set. Okay. It's not coincidence that this is the cube. So if you are interested in drawing the n-dimensional cube, just draw this whole set, and you will have a picture of the n-dimensional cube. And uh, this thing is called the Boolean poset or Boolean lattice or Boolean algebra. I wrote it Boolean poset. Okay. Now let me say in, in words how I'm drawing these pictures. It's clear to you that I'm drawing a segment from a smaller element to a bigger element. But I don't I don't draw all such things because I would make a mess, right? I would have to make a segment from one to one to three, a segment from empty set to two three. But the point is that, for example, if I already drew the segment from one to one two, and the segment from one two to one two three, then I already know that one is less than one two three, and I don't need to draw it. Okay? And so, when we draw a picture like this, what we draw is the elements, and uh, what are called the cover relations, and the cover relations are basically the 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 less than relations that are not implied by any other relations. And this is this is called the Hasse diagram. So I, I put a dot for each element, and then I draw a segment from u to b if u is less than b and there is no w such that u is less than w okay. and these we call the cover relations For 
example, we say that one, two, three covers one, three. Okay. And I don't know about you, but I much prefer a picture like this instead of some technical definition like this. And so it's good to get good at drawing these kinds of posits. Okay. Any questions about this this uh, thing so far? Good. So presumably, in order to define a poset for a polytope. Um, so if I have a polytope, then I'm going to define something called the phase poset. I denote it like this. The phase poset and so it's a pair, right? So the elements are the faces. If, if a face is smaller than the other one, the, the only natural thing is containment. So that's it. So for example, actually, this is not called f of p, it's called l of p, and you will see why in a second. So let's do a couple of examples of this. which is the empty phase, right? Then what are the next smaller faces? The, the vertices. So I have four vertices, okay? Then I should put the edges. So for example, AB is an edge. And it contains vertex A and it contains vertex B. But you see, for example, AC is not an edge, so I don't have a, a face AC here. Okay. The next edge that I have is BC. So I get this. The next face that I have is CD. So I get this. And then the next face that I have is DA. This. Okay. And then finally, I have. quadrilateral, just like this. Okay. And so this is the face poset of uh, the polytope. Okay. It looks kind of nice, actually, I think. I think it's a nice picture. And I think it looks a little bit like the previous picture. Um, and there is some content to that statement. So there is, there are many ways to say why a poset can be nice. And this poset is nice in many ways. And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of the class. What are the nice properties that this poset has that random posets don't have? Let me make another remark, which is the following. What happens if you take the face poset of a simplex. Okay. So let's think about it, for example, um, delta 3 is the three-dimensional simplex. Okay. So I'm not going to draw this thing because it's, it will take me too long. Um, but if you think about it, what do the faces of delta 3 correspond to? They're, they're exactly the subset, right? The, any, any subset of vertices forms a face. 
So there is a there is a, bi a bijection between faces of the simplex and subsets of the set of numbers from 1 to d. So that means that this is exactly the the Boolean poset. And again, if you want to make sure that you completely understood how this works, this is a this is a nice easy exercise to prove. But there is a, there is something to be said about why there is a bijection between the faces of a simplex and the subsets. And we need you need to prove that. Here we're just looking at a picture, but it is true. Okay. Um, finally, I can tell you what it means to be combinatorial equi equivalent. So two polytopes are said to be combinatorially equivalent if they have the same combinatorics and somehow you should think of this as the combinatorics of the picture when, when you look at this picture you don't care about coordinates you just care about the, the relative of the positions of the faces so when I talk about the combinatorial structure what I mean is this poset so then I say that P and Q are said to be combinatorially isomorphic if they have the same face poset. So finally, finally we know what it means to, to have this incombinatorial structure. Okay. So that's the face poset. Um, so now I, I need to just give you a bunch of background information on, on uh, posets so I can state the next theorem. So let's, let me be. So here's an example of a poset. By the way, I, I guess I didn't say it, but in, in the picture of a poset, edges are always directed up. So when you see an edge, I don't need to draw an arrow to it because you always put the, the lower element under the bigger element. And so any picture like, like this defines the poset. So let me make some definitions. So, so let's say that you have a poset. So what's a chain? A chain is something like of elements that are linearly ordered. An example of a chain is this. Those three elements form a chain and an example of not a chain would be something like taking this guy and this guy. So those guys are not comparable so they don't form a chain. So that's a chain. And I'm going to say that P is graded if uh, for any A less than B, all the basically no, no matter which way you go from A to B, you should have the, the same number of steps. All maximal. from A to B have the same length. Okay. And I guess I should say that what I mean by length, so a chain like this is said to have length. Well, what would you say this is, length 2 or length 3? It's two actually, it doesn't matter too much, but basically how many steps you take. So, so it's like k minus one. One and two steps. Okay. So in a sense, this, this notion of length is a little bit coming from graph theory. It's, it's kind of what's the length of the path. Uh, so for example, let's see if this poset is graded. Well, first thing you have to say is, is this chain that I drew here maximal? 
And what we mean, what we mean by maximal is maximal by containment. So can you add other things to it and still be a chain? So this is not maximal, right? Because you can have this element and still be a chain. But now that's a maximal chain. And here is another maximal chain from here to here to here. Okay? And then that means that this guy is not great. Not great. Okay. And I should say that actually, really the way that you should look at this is, you know, if it's a positive greater or not, you just want to see if it has levels. Okay. So if you look at the pictures here, this, this clearly has levels. Level 0, level 1, level 2, level 3. This picture also clearly has levels. This picture also clearly has levels. If it has levels, it's graded. If it doesn't have levels, then it's not graded. So in other words, um, I should say, in other words, have you seen this E, I, E? So if you haven't, it's, I think it's Latin, id est, but it, it means, what does it mean actually? I think it basically means, in other words, esto es, esto es. I think only mathematicians say esto es. But anyway, IE, you'll see it in, in, people write this all the time. IE, B has levels. Levels or ranks. So we say, you know, if it has levels, then you go level zero is rank zero, rank one, rank two, and so on. Okay. So that's the same example of something that is not graded, uh, but an example of something that is graded is the Boolean. The Boolean post. Why is that graded? Because there is a very clear notion of what level you're in. You know, if you're a subset of five elements, then you're in level five. Yeah. And so, you know, so we say that the rank of a set is just the cardinality of the set. So that's what it means to be a graded post set. Um, let's say something else. So we say that a post set P is a lattice. If any two elements have a least upper bound which we call uh, we can write it like this and we call it the join the join of A and B It's a set that is less than a 
and let them be. And it's the greatest such set, right? Because any element that is less than A and less than B has to be less than the intersection. So, so this is just the intersection. And similarly, the, the join is just the union. So if, if you ever forget which way these things point, just, just think back to this notation. It's clearly motivated by, by this, but people didn't want to use the same symbol, so they use a little d instead of, instead of a u. Okay? I think always when you, when you think of, when you learn a new notion, you should see an example of something that is and an example of something that is not. So let's see an example of something that is not left. So something that is not a lattice is this. Can you tell me why? have a unique least upper bound, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have these two, and these two are kind of, the canon is to be a least upper bound, but, but no, no upper bound is less than or equal to all upper bounds. So that's, so that's why this is not a lattice. You should realize that, and let me give you a, a, a much easier example. I don't know, something like, I'm just making this up, I don't know. <laughs> Why is this not a lattice immediately? Without, I mean, I'm covering, it, I'm covering it up now. Why is that not a lattice? It has two maximal elements or many ma minimal elements. Because you, you need that if you, if you take the meat of everything. What could that be? It has to be a unique lowest element. And if you take the join of everything, it has to be a unique maximum element. So any lattice must have a unique bottom element and a unique top element. So if it doesn't look like that, then you know immediately it's not a lattice. So here's something to say. Lattices have a maximal element a maximum, you have to be very careful about maximum versus maximal, right? A maximum element which will one hat and a minimum which we call zero hat. So if you want to know if something is a lattice, the first thing you should check is whether it kind of looks like this. Okay. But you can guess what I'm about to prove, right? Of this, of this Preludes. Um, all of this points to the, the following theorem, a very important theorem. And again, now it's it's kind of obvious why I call the phase poset L and not F. It's a lattice. So if you have a polytope P, then. L of P is a lattice graded by, it makes sense, right? What, what are the levels of the faces? The, the dimension. So the rank of a face should be basically the dimension of a face. But here you want to think about this a little bit and see if you got the numbers right. Um, what dimension does the lowest element have? The lowest phase. Minus one. The lowest phase is the empty phase, and we said that the empty phase has dimension minus one, and we don't want things to have rank minus one because both of start at rank zero. So we should just add one. Here. You should notice now why it's extremely important that we let the empty set be a phase. Because if the empty set is not a phase, 
then this has no chance of being a lattice because it wouldn't have a bottom element. So this is really the reason why you want the entity, the entities to be a fix. Okay? It is one of the reasons, and a very important. One. Okay, B. Every interval. by an interval. Just, just copy the definition that you know of interval and I mean exactly the same thing. Right? So the interval fg consists of the elements that are greater than or equal to f, less than or equal to g. It's just that the order is partial, but the definition is the same. Any interval is also a phase lattice. That's already not trivial, if you think about it. If you just zoom in, maybe, maybe let's just look at an example of what intervals look like. So, for example, here, we could consider the interval from B to A, B, C, D. So what does the interval from B to A, B, C, D look like? There are the things that are greater than or equal to B and less than or equal to ABCD. In other words, there are the things between B and ABCD when you walk up in all possible ways. So I get this picture, and what this what this uh, theorem says is that that picture, there also exists some polytope for that picture. So that's what that says. Think every interval of height two, and by height two I mean that, that it has two levels. It has three levels, sorry, length two. Yeah. Every interval of height two is a diamond. So a diamond is just this process. And you saw in the previous example that that interval that I looked at was a diamond. But that's true for anything. Okay. And the last thing is that the opposite poset L of P opposite, by which I mean you take the poset and you just turn it upside down, is also a phase lattice. So that already puts a, a lot of structure on this on this poster. You realize now that this poster is not any old random poster. Um, it's very structured. For example, if you look at a poster and you see an interval of length two and, and it has three elements here instead of two, you know there's no there's no polytope. Okay. So this puts a lot of structure on face on uh, face posters. Let's see, how are we doing here? Okay. So any questions about the statement before I start proving this? Make sense? But I, I have a question. You mean that every lattice, from every lattice you can well, uh, construct a polytope? Yeah. So let me repeat the question. The question is, given a lattice, can you find a polytope yeah. uh, corresponding to it? And the answer is no. And here's an example, right? So, is this a lattice? Yes. You need to stare at it for a little bit, but, you, but this is a lattice. And it doesn't satisfy uh, property C. Okay. That immediately tells you this. There is no polytope for this guy. But what if you have the C condition? I mean, is that in, is that so uh, enough or so? Or is that condition? So, no. So the answer again is no. So I should say that there exist uh, lattices 
there is this process that satisfies all of these properties, and there is no polytope for them. But you should know actually that actually there's, there's a very nice family of, of posets, and they're called Eulerian posets, and the name Eulerian Eulerian comes from Euler's relation, and they're posets that kind of look like polytopes, but they're not quite polytopes, not necessarily. And, and that's a very beautiful family that has lots of nice properties, and I think that would be also a good, uh, a good topic for a project. And it's a bit of a topological notion, actually. So what, somehow there is, there is some topology hiding here in, in, uh, in these posets. But no, for now the answer is basically no. These are some nice properties, but these properties do not characterize um, face posets. And I should tell you basically that nobody knows how to characterize face posets. I wish that I had an answer for you, but if you give me a very complicated post-it, I have no way of telling you. I don't, I don't think anybody has a way of telling you if there's a, a polytope for it or not. I think that's a pretty open problem that nobody knows how to do, or maybe actually, I, I could even imagine that people know that this is not possible. So it's a problem that could be NP-hard or one of these things. If you're interested in this, we can look it up in the literature and see what the status is. But it's pretty hopeless to characterize uh, phase lapses. But at least these are some necessary conditions. Okay. So let's let's uh, let me just give you a sketch of the proof of this stuff. Okay. So why this allows? What is the meat? Of two faces. The intersections. You would hope it's the intersection, right? <laughs> but you have to think: is the intersection in the poset or not? Yes. Very often in posets you just want to say the, no. the join is the intersection, but you better check that this thing is close under intersection, right? No, really. So is the intersection of F and G a face? 